the way that we've done planet searches for a long time in my field, which is radio velocity, is you just kind of blindly go out and look at a bunch of stars and monitor them for months or years and hope that something interesting happens eventually. And TESS is going to change a lot of that. The basic idea is that if you look at a star that's just sitting in space, minding its own business, then the brightness of that star, for most stars, doesn't change very much. But if that star is sitting in space and a planet crosses between the star and your line of sight, then the planet, which doesn't shine on its own, blocks out part of the starlight. And so what that means is that if you're watching you know, how bright the star is over time, then the star is bright, 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 and then the planet moves in front of it and it gets dimmer for a little while, and then as the planet transits off the face of the star, then it becomes bright again. We can tell both how big the planet is in relation to the star, based on how deep the dip is, and based on how long it takes to go in front of the star, how long the transit lasts. That'll tell you how far away the planet is from the star. And so when people talk about the habitable zone around a star, that's what they're talking about. It's a distance range where the energy from the star means that the planet is a temperature where if there were water on the surface of the planet, which is not guaranteed, but if there were water, that water could be liquid. So these are the four cameras and their location inside the spacecraft. So each camera has a 24 by 24 degree field. Um, for reference, one of those squares is roughly the size of the constellation Orion in the night sky, just to give you a sense of scale. And so at any given point in time, Tess's four cameras stack to make this kind of column shape that'll show up in just a moment. And so yeah, it looks at one column, and then 27 days later it rotates a little bit and looks at the next one over. And so once it finishes in the southern hemisphere, it does the whole you know, thing, it flips upside down, and then repeats exactly that same strategy up in the north. So what's happening right now is each of the four cameras is installed in its own chamber, and then we drop the pressure and we drop the temperature down to simulate what's gonna happen in space. Normally we test in these big things that take these huge tanks of LN2, liquid nitrogen tanks, and we have a camera in there and this simulates like the environment that our cameras will be in while they're in space. As you can see, can't really move this around. This has to stay in a lab. So we wanted to make something smaller that we could move um, either onto like a roof setting where there might be less light and we could take a picture of the night sky or out into like the woods where there will be far less light pollution. What we've set up here is this, what we're calling the unicorn. We have these other big chambers that we call dragons. And then we have smaller chambers in the dragons that we call ponies. And then we have the unicorn because this idea to take a camera outside and take images of actual stars came a while ago and people were like, yeah, but we're not actually gonna do that right now. Like it exists, but not really. Like no one knows it exists, but it kind of exists. So then we kind of brought it to life. You wanna take a picture? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so come Oof. and stand here and do this okay. and smile. Okay. Alright. Ready? Don't move. Hey, there you are. Nice. <laughs> so these are this is one camera, two camera, three camera, four camera. Uh, so all four cameras will make a nice image. Do you want to take one? My lab works on the flight light cameras, and the lab in N83 works on the actual cameras. So we're going to go down this way. Having blue light theoretically doesn't cause, if light leaks into the chambers where the cameras are, we don't get as much of an effect. So now we shall enter the lab. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> so this has the first camera we received. We are testing the cameras at space conditions, so we keep the chambers at minus 75 degrees Celsius. They're kept in these chambers also to be pumped down to vacuum. Hi, Gabor. <laughs> We 
have four of these setups, one for each of the cameras that we could potentially be testing. We're sending four cameras to space on test. We have named the chambers after different dragons in pop culture. So we have Norberta from Harry Potter, Draco, which is the constellation, Smog from Lord of the Rings, and Falcor from Neverending Story. And so that helps us keep them straight. Tess will stand, I would say, about chest height with the average adult. So between like, I think it's like five-ish feet tall. So Tess will be, like it can be hugged by a human. I am primarily sort of a hardware person doing testing and verification. All right, so this is the camera when it's fully mounted. So over here is that front plate of the chamber. And then here's a ring that's used for mounting. And then that's the actual camera part of it. Part of having everything clean is because once you're in space, you can't clean things. Optics are quite sensitive to debris. So if you have things on your lenses, that will affect the light. So you'll have sections where you can't see anything. And once it you know, goes up, we can't fix it. We can't go up and say, oh no, there's the smudge. The, um, the dragon chamber, this one is Norberta. So there are four flight cameras, and we've got four of these chambers, and each one is, they're slightly different the way they mount. So each camera has a specific chamber that it goes in. So the camera, usually we're testing it at about minus 75 C. The chamber itself gets colder than that. So this one, we simulate stars going through the various mirrors to create a star field on the camera so we can test to see what stars will look like when we're up so we can see if we have the focus right, all those sorts of things. Because we have four chambers, which we were originally only planning on having two, it's getting quite cramped back in the clean rooms. There are days when I enjoy it sort of you know, working my way through cables and other times, I just want to rip things, but I never do, <laughs> I never do. Carolyn started first. Um, I think she started a year before me and she was kind of my guide and <laughs> introduced me to everyone in the group and people in related groups that were working on other telescopes and kind of gave me like the insider's scoop on how everything works in tests. And then in the summer, Sorme came on and we made this little group essentially. There were a lot of new hires at the time um, who are all like 20 somethings, recent graduates, like not quite going into grad school, but still interested in research. And so we, 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 we still need to come up with a name. <laughs> Right now we're the Tess youths, but, but we're working on it. <laughs> I love learning that most of the engineers working on tests, at least at the junior level, are also women. For whatever reason, MIT has been this like gathering point for badass women scientists over the past couple of years, and it's amazing. It's the best thing ever. When we finished running these experiments, when we finished verifying the focuses, we send all of these cameras off to be integrated into the satellite at Orbital. Orbital is the satellite company that's helping tests with all of the logistics of putting something in space. And they work with Goddard and the team there to do the holistic satellite testing. And then about a, yeah, a year from now, the whole thing goes down to Florida and it's gonna launch from Cape Canaveral. Next March at the moment is the idea, March 20th, it goes up and, and science starts. <laughs> And you can say, yeah, I got to work on that, that those images are either terrible, partially thanks to me, or really nice, partially thanks to me. I will say, usually my job trumps other people's job. They're like, oh, I do this really cool thing, and I'm like, really? Because I do this really cool thing.